This I conference said, will now be recorded. Just did wager talk today. Grabbed a little breakfast real quick. Just ran back in, so uh, we're good to go. To make sure you guys can hear me and see me. Yes, sir. Thank you, Ernesto. Ernesto, welcome, my man. Welcome to the party. All right, all right. We got a lot to get to. I'm really excited for today. Very excited. Any questions you may have, drop those in there. Let's give two two minutes for everyone else to join the party since it's only 1 p.m. Let me put these back on a little more comfortable. Oh, let me grab my papers. I want to share some stuff with you guys today that I never did before, at least in detail. I think it's very important. It's economical. We see what's happening and uh, just out of respect and out of love for you guys. There's some things that are happening and that obviously are going to happen that I hope you are prepared for. That's more important than sports betting, more important than any of that shit. Hold on. Oh, wow, I missed a call from Missy. Sorry, Missy, if you're on here, I apologize. I swear I went to grab something to eat um, in between <coughs> Wager Talk today and the steam room because I wanted to make sure I'm ready, able to give them 100% because there's a lot of good things to get to besides just um, bets. But we will do that. Let me write some things down. Just give them two minutes for people to walk to uh, mosey on in. You guys should have got the Olympics. Spain, Spain minus four, Spain minus four. We also bet. Um, minus uh, I mean, the under, sorry, 138 and 137. Um, we got down also minus three and a half. And those plays have been doing good. Yesterday, I, I uh, little little lost, cost us two units, I think, um, in the Colorado game because we bet Colorado money line and then Colorado first five money line, Colorado first five run line. So the money line was at plus money and uh, plus a half a run was minus 135. And I said, you know, we've lost enough now in baseball this season that's cost me the, the the profit. I mean, we would be up overall, if not for baseball. It would be a winning year already without even football. Like we would be in the best freaking position with football coming. We would be in a better position than we were last year. That's for damn sure. Um, had this baseball season not been this bad. And in the groups that I work with, the two of them in their defense, I mean, shit, they've given us how many winning seasons in a row. Um, um, so I can't be too mad at them, but it does sting. All right, all right. All right, we are caught up, we are caught up. Nothing else coming in. Hold on. He's going to take a bite of his, his breakfast real fast, too. Sorry. Don't mean to be rude. Please forgive me. This is the goal I'm going to share with you. 
in all honesty, this cost me probably over 20 grand to get this information in seminars. But it's it's changed my life and I wanted to change yours too. So all right, let's dive right in. We ain't gonna wait no more. We got business to get to it Friday. August is upon us, so there's no more mess time to mess around. We got five months. We got August, September, October, November, December. We got five months to win back 130 plus units and then get out ahead to make it another winning year. With that said, the goal is always to just be profitable and that once you get profitable, to remain profitable, to stay above that, that number whatever number you want to get to, to where then you're not trying to increase bet size anymore. To where you say, you know what? I'm comfortable now. I have this much bankroll. I'm comfortable betting this amount. I'll stick to it for a few years, even two years, three years. Even if I turn a profit, I'll take that profit and maybe invest it elsewhere, not put it back in the sports or I'll put some of it back in the sports. But the goal is to get to that point where year by year doesn't even matter. You're so in the long term. Like for myself, this year being down 130 units is irrelevant in the big picture because I'm working with profits that they'll go back 10 plus years just about. So like this last few months that have cost me that amount of units, it's just seemed it, like it looks like one dot on a big graph. It's just a small like sample of time. And at once we, we bounce back and once we get back plus, like once you zoom out from that, like it'll be so minuscule. And then if you're here with me next year, the year after that, the year after that, it'll look so minuscule. That's the goal to get to that point. Now, let's just keep it real. We're up over the last seven days, which is good. We're trending in the right direction. Um, but the truth is baseball has still cost us. So let's go over some math because we got to keep it real. That's more important than anything, transparency. Um, just like I always talk about regression towards the mean, no one's ever as good or bad as they look. It's, it's it got to keep it real for winning betters as well. So here's the deal. We talk about sustainable and unsustainable. When someone's negative EV lifetime, when you know for certain that this sports better is, is a losing sports better, meaning even if they're selling picks, you know they may be up this year, but you know lifetime they're not. They're not telling you this is what I was up this year. This is what I was up last year. This is what I'm up since I started selling. So deep down, you know that, yeah, they may be having a good week, a good month, a good year, a good season. But deep down, you know, they're negative EV. They're as negative EV as anybody else long term. Like you can't trust in the long term. You could try to time them, which is a fool's errand. But at least if, if you know enough, you could determine who's plus EV and who's not. So the, 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 when, if someone's negative EV, regardless of how hot they're running in the short term, they're going to regress to the mean. That short term, though, could last. It could last a week, a month, two months, a season. But after a certain amount of bets, it's just mathematically impossible for, t for that to still be profitable. To be placing negative EV bet after negative EV bet after negative EV bet and still be profitable. Just like it's impossible to keep firing plus EV bets and be negative after a big enough sample, which is why the casino will throw you out even before you're up, even if you're down. Just like I showed with the video that Johnny has put out when I played blackjack with Kelly and they threw me out at Mandalay Bay and I explained that I'm down 40, over 40,000 lifetime at Mandalay Bay playing blackjack. For whatever reason, at that property, the sessions that I played, the hours that I put in myself, I'm down. But they know if this guy plays long enough, if he just, he just hasn't seen enough hands. So shit, we got the best of them, let him go. Because if he sees enough hands, he's going to beat us. He's going to progress towards the mean. And his mean is obviously he's has an edge. Because every time he has the edge, he places his biggest bets. They may not have worked out his way yet in the short term. But the math is telling us that every time he has the edge, this guy knows when to up his bet. So as long as he keeps doing this over and over and over again, he's going to beat us. He just needs to see enough hands. So what does the casino say? No, no, no. You're not going to see enough hands. It's the same with sports betting. Over a big enough sample, we will always be up. 
because we're plus EV. That's why when you look over the last two years, four years, six years, but over a small sample, that's what you, we need to get over. Like this is as bad as it's been, as horrific as it's been. And yet here's where we stand. Let's do it. We got to be transparent. So we, like I said, we're a little profitable over the last seven days. We're up about 13 units. It's still been a, a, a horrific baseball season. Don't get me wrong. And it's all calm right there. So let's say we're down right now, 132, 132 after the winning. A few things haven't been graded yet, but that, that's good. We'll, we'll keep it at that. So we say we start with a $10,000 bankroll. What do we bet? 0.25 and 0.25 increments. We bet size between 1X and 5X. The rating at Wager Talk is that. It's a rating. They use percent, but they could use units. They could use stars. It's irrelevant. It's there to reflect strength of play, not bet size. It's not even uh, uh, a recommendation of bet size. It's just a rating. So we follow the 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%, 5% rating by betting 0.25%, real percent of bankroll, 0 0.50, 0 0.75, 1% and 1.25. So we're never betting more than 1.25% of bankroll. So with a $10,000 bankroll, if we're on a dog, we're never betting more than $125. If we're on a favorite, we're never betting more than to win 125. So if he's minus 200, we're betting 250 to win that 125. But we're never betting to win more than 125. That's with a $10,000 bankroll. So where are we? Off a $10,000 bankroll, we're at minus 3,300, 33%, which again, I'm not happy about it at all. It's been, it's been awful. It's been a few months now carrying over. Um, and it's all coming baseball. In fact, let's look at baseball. MLB, because Ace keeps it real. We're down 200 units in baseball 211 units that's 50 percent of over 50 percent of the baseball bankroll so without baseball without this baseball season we would be up almost 80 units which would be right on point with where we should be actually we should have turned a little profit in baseball already maybe 30 40 units so we would technically be up 120 140 units heading into this august which would have been amazing because we would have been nearing that 50% increase to starting capital, because that's what 200 units are. We increase our starting capital by 50%. You started with 100 grand, you should be up 50. You started with a million, you should be up 500,000. You started with 5,000, you should be up 2,500. That's when we get the plus 200 units. So we would have been about that minus one, plus 140 range had we just had a, a, a slightly profitable baseball season. Not even like last year, we finished number one or the last few years that have been so profitable. So it just shows you that one sport could do it and you can't time it because how do I know going in? Like, I'm not going to bet baseball was the most profitable sport last year. Well, football was actually when you combine college football and NFL, but then it was baseball. And most years, baseball has been right there at the top. So I got to follow through. And even though they're near a thousand bets, we're at 900 bets or so, we're getting nearing that statistical significance. I also see the minus 8% ROI that's not sustainable. Just like we're not ever going to have a long-term 9% plus ROI in baseball over a thousand bets. So we're going to regress. This looks good for baseball over the last two months. We should pick up some units. We really should. Um, just because, again, it's almost impossible. to continue doing that. And it's over the last 30 days where baseball's cost us 160 units. That's where it's all gone. It's all gone to baseball. And again, my job is to place the most advantageous bets I can and to monitor the results of those bets, not just based on the outcome, but based on how the market reacts to those bets. And everything I'm seeing is exactly like it's been every other year. They get respect when they bet it. I've been able to pinpoint the manipulation. I talked about it on multiple steam rooms, how they're doing it like they did in the NBA totals, where 
They'll manipulate the game up one way and then bet the other way later in the day. They'll do it on money lines. They'll do it on totals um, because it doesn't take a lot of money to move it in NBA totals, Major League Baseball sides and totals, college basketball totals. So they're able to manipulate the market that way. We've been seeing that. I've been picking that off. Um, what's cost us is a lot of those bets that they hit multiple ways, just having cash like they did last year. They, they've gone against. And like yesterday, I didn't play it out that way. And I, like I said, it cost us two units because usually I'd go 2% money line, 2% run line. So that's something I had to be with, honest with myself that, wait, why did I allow, why did I change what I'm doing just because how we're running in the short term? I need to stick to the guns, stick to the guns and just keep rinsing and repeating, rinsing and repeating and trusting in the system. But it just goes to show you that even being able to zoom out, even being able to see my bankroll, the, the uh, advancement in life as far as financially that I have over the last decade betting. Like all that, as, as, as obvious as that is, there's still, it's still emotional when you're losing in the short term. And when it's not stopping, like we've, we've had a couple uh, week where we're, okay, this is it. We're back there on the right side. We're about to heat up. We're about to go on that run. And then boom, the bottom falls out again. And it's like, it's almost testing us. Like I see in every market and I touched on it. Um, And I believe last week's steam room and when I did on the YouTube, you know, you look at so many amazing companies, again, Apple, one of the most successful companies on the planet. Is it the most highly valued, right? Over a trillion, what have you. If you look January, 2024, February, 2024, March, 2024, April, 2024, four straight months, they lost money. Their stock went down. In fact, it was a high of 199 at in December of 2023 and went to a low of 160 four months later, which is what? Losing 20% in four months. It's going to happen. That's a market. You're seeing, like I said, even the best companies. Here, let's pull up BlackRock. We all know BlackRock. What a great company BlackRock is. Let's look at them. Let's look at their monthlies. I see August 2023, they lost money. September 2023, they lost money. August, I mean, October 2023, they lost money. Even these amazing companies have three, four straight losing months. I see them here. November 2021, they lost money. December 2021, they lost money. January 2022, they lost money. February 2022, they lost money. That's business. But they continue to trend up. Because if you look at the price, zoom out, here's what we see. BlackRock was selling for $411 on uh, let's go to a month like this one what's this month we're in july we're in august now in august of 2020 blackrock was selling for 580 dollars we're now in august of 2024 and it's selling for 850 dollars so we've got a what 50 percent increase in four years not bad for that big of a company. It's hard, hard to, to, to increase when you're moving billions of dollars. It's easier to double up, triple up when you're moving less. Like Warren Buffett says, now Berkshire Hathaway has to make such huge, 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 huge trades where if they pick up three, five, eight percent, it's it's a, a grand slam, not a home run. Like I said, you see BlackRock, one of the best companies. Speaking of Warren Buffett, look, look at Berkshire Hathaway. I see them multiple times where they've had three, four, five losing months in a row. Look at Berkshire Hathaway, February 2018th, March 2018th, April 2018th, May 2018th, June 2018th, Berkshire Hathaway, five straight losing months, where at the end of that, 
it was valued at under $200 a share. This is Berkshire B, not Berkshire A, the one that cost 50,000 a share. This is Berkshire B, okay? It was under $200. Now here we are, it's up near 450, 420, 430, 450. Why? Because you, it's trending up like it's supposed to. But along the way, it's gonna chop, it's gonna go down, it's gonna go up. As long as it's constantly trending up, that's plus EV. That's what plus EV looks like. It doesn't go up in a straight line. In fact, any time it ever has is when there's been either uh, insider, like not even insider trading, where we saw it happen with Madoff, where it's been Ponzi schemes. They're, they're outright, outright scams. Anytime anything has gone straight up, it's been a scam with Enron, with Madoff's fund. They're just a scam. Nothing goes straight up. In fact, the guy contacted the SEC like 10 times over five years prior to Madoff getting arrested, indicted. This gentleman contacted the SEC over the dozen times, I believe, and said, this is mathematically impossible. There's no way in hell this guy's fund made money every single month, this many consecutive months. No chance, zero, none. This guy makes money when the market goes up. This guy makes money when the market goes down. This guy makes money when the market's going sideways. How's that possible? It's not. And what did we find out? It was all built on a Ponzi scheme. Same thing with touting. 99.5% of sports bettors lose long-term. Touting is a business that's based on the Ponzi of pushing short-term results as long-term. Getting the better emotionally convinced that this 9-0 run matters in the big picture, even if they zoom out and they're 20 and 40, their last 60. That doesn't matter. The 9 and 0 is all that matters. You see the Ponzi scheme? It's the same exact thing, guys. Again, you already bought, so I'm not trying to convince you of anything. I'm not trying to sell you anything. I'm just trying to explain to you, if you're in here trying to time the market and guess whether I'm gonna win today or this weekend, dude, we're not on the same page. We're playing a different game. And if we're playing a different game, I'm going to disappoint you. Like I've done to whoever's just, just jumped on with the mindset of I'm going to be in there for the long run for the year. But they jumped on two months ago and they're like, oh, this dude sucks. I'm out of here. He, uh, he got me buried. No, no, no. If you just followed the blueprint and you really are committed to long-term betting and investing in the market, then you need to follow along. And let's talk about it two years from now. Let's have that talk two years from now. If you want to have that talk right now, yeah, you need to be trying to time, playing the fool's errand of trying to time shit and good luck with that. I, I can't do it. I don't play that game. I played the long game and that's what's won for me. I play the long game in investments. That's why I'm invested in gold. I mean, in, in gold, yes. And in art, I know how long the art's going to sit there. In fact, I've been in Masterworks. I have over six figures sitting in Masterworks for two plus years. Only one of my paintings is sold. That's it. Just one of them. A Basquiat painting that I'm invested in. The other 31, I believe, that I have right now. I'll tell you now. Haven't even sold. That's it, one Basquiat, one Basquiat sold that I was in and I gained 33.7%. So I don't mind, they could hold my money. If every time they sell me a painting, they're gonna give me 30%, 40%, 20%, 15%, 80%. They've done some crazy return over the years since it's been in action. But I knew going in, this is long-term. I'm not emailing these people asking, why aren't you selling my paintings? Where's my money? 
I knew going in that if I'm going to give them six figures, they're going to hold it for probably five plus years for me to see a return. But it was worth it for me to see a, the returns I'm not going to get in the stock market that I'm not going to get from my financial planner. I'm not going to get from what I have in bonds or CDs or other, you know, cash instruments, holding cash, you know, USDC. So I'm sitting on, I swear to you, and again, the thing to brag, it's just the amount of paintings that are just sitting there doing nothing. 31 artworks that haven't sold that I know are sitting there. They'll sell over the years. I knew it's a long-term commitment. So I'm not going to invest in something and not understand it. And too many novice sports bettors get into sports betting and learn it from other losing bettors. They go online, they go to gambling Twitter, they go to gambling Instagram, they go to gambling uh, TikTok, and they look at all that great content that's out there. And of course, like 99.5% of all sports bettors have losing lifetime earnings, 99.5% of all touts have losing lifetime earnings and content creators have losing lifetime earnings. That's just factual, nothing wrong with that. And they provide some entertainment, some fun, and probably even some good information at times. Um, so nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But we're playing a different game. And again, if you want to partner and play that game, it's paid off for me. It's paid off for me, but it has taken time. It definitely has taken time. Just like real estate, you know, you don't buy a house, even if it's cash flow positive and it's leaving you, you know, $100 a month after paying off the mortgage and paying all the taxes and paying all the upkeep, you know, based on having a tenant, your cash flow positive $100 a month. That's great. $1,200 a year plus the, the property's appreciating, right? And eventually it's going to get paid off and that monthly rent is going to come to you as clear profit but it's going to take a decade for that house to get paid off if not longer that's the investment but after a decade you have four five six of those properties sending you that money you don't have to work anymore all of a sudden that 1500 rent two thousand dollar rent thousand dollar rent check that's no longer going to the mortgage Sure, you're going to pay taxes, you're going to pay some upkeep, but now that mortgage is paid off. Not only is the house still appreciating, but now that, that is income. But you had to play the long game for that to happen. You're not going to buy a property and, and think that the people that lose money are the ones that, that do the flips, that think they're going to buy a distressed property, put five grand into it and just flip it, flip it, flip it, flip it. <clears throat> you got to hold, man. There's very few people that make money flipping. You have to be such a specialist at that. I know so many people that got into it thinking that's what they were going to do and lost money trying to flip houses. I promise you, the long game is the way to play everything as far as investments go. If you want life-changing wealth and generational wealth, it's only in the long game, never in the short game. Unless, again, you just like, get lucky. You're that one in a billion that walks by a slot machine puts three dollars in and wins 11 million and that's life-changing money you do the right things with it you set up your life forever stop bothering me ace don't have time for this nonsense he's got serious business serious business just blocking people left and right my girl taught me how to block people i love this boom babe two more blocked just blocking everybody I love it. Best thing you ever taught me. All right. I got some uh, trades in crypto. If you guys are day trading, you know, ba based on this drop, it's there's a, a lot of volatility. There's some good buys right now. There's some good buys. I would, I, I would like if I was doing a, a swing trade for the next like. If you want to make money in the next couple of weeks, like a good 10%, maybe 20% even, excuse me, I got to take another bite. My God, that's so good. I can't believe I, I can't eat it all right now. Um, yeah, I would buy some ADA, Cardano, and some AVAX, Avalanche. 
they're really underpriced right now. They got crushed when Bitcoin dumped. Right now, the bears are in control. I think it's 63. Do I have my break even? 63.5 is the line in the sand. Above 63.5, the bulls are in control. Below 63.5, the bears are in control. Right now, the bears are totally in control. And if the if the cues keep dropping, oh boy. Wow. The cues have had their sixth losing day in the last eight. No one's even looking up and talking about it. The tech sector is getting demolished. Even uranium, uranium, all those, all those commodities are even are crashing. So no one's even expect, looking at what's coming. It's about to get bad, guys. It's about to get bad. All right, here I'm going to do this real quick now. Then we'll talk about some games. I'm going to give you some dates that I really want you to pay attention to. Okay, these are some really important dates. This August, this month that we're in right now is extremely important. Right around August 19th, August 20th, you could expect to hear some chaos. Things are going to start to deteriorate. Have if you're if you're long in the market, I highly recommend taking profits and, and not leaving that any uh, paper gains on the table, I highly recommend taking profits by August 20th at the latest. The high probability that things are really going to start to deteriorate. And it's going to last into September. It'll last into September. We'll have volatility. Then they'll try to juice it up a little bit around the election time. People get excited for the elections, but then right after the elections, right about December 12th, write that down, December 10th. So we have August 19th, 20th, and now we're at December 10th. Right around December 10th, you can expect negativity to start to form. The negative talk about the market, negativity in the world, slight chaos starting the show right around the 10th, right around the 10th, and then right around Christmas Eve. 23rd, 24th, things start to really get bad, really bad. Write that down, 23rd, 24th. Conditions really deteriorate. That's what I wrote. Very bad, very bad. At least we'll have like a short-term positive day in the new year like we always do. The first week, first two weeks of January will be good. But then right after March Madness, write this down, April 14th, April 14th, 2025, April 14th, 2025, that's when the huge negative starts to break, to, to show. Not only does do the charts appear that way, not only does the debt, we've reached 35 trillion in debt for the first time ever, and we had the highest interest rate we've had in what, 30 years? That's not good. When your interest rate is really high, and your debt is 35 trillion, your interest payments are ridiculous. We have the most, most evictions ever coming into August. So people are at least two months late on their rent, highest eviction notice. We have the highest credit card debt in our history. So the most money ever on credit cards at a time when the interest rate is the highest. So that's terrible. None of the, the balance is being paid off, just interest, if that. The highest repossession rate has happened over the last three months. So people that bought cars six months ago, a year ago, when things were a little bit better, are now not able to keep up with their payments. I think it's six now, six out of 10 or seven out of 10 Californians are at least one to two months behind on their power bill. So that's seven, almost seven out of 10 people walking around in one of the most heavily populated states have not been able to pay, keep up with their power bill during the summer months. They're behind. Things will get bad. I, I wish I'm wrong. Let's hope I'm wrong. Let's pray I'm wrong. This is one of those things where I really hope I'm wrong, but I doubt I'm, I am. They're not going to be able to kick this can down the road much longer. And I'm telling you, August, uh, uh, April 14th, May 9th, May 9th, The negative continues. June 15th, 
more chaos, more chaos. Jupiter square Saturn, that's just like what happens in April 14th, which is a huge negative day. Saturn conjuncts with the North Node. That's terrible. And you will see that negative will last long. So that April 14th day will fly into May the same way. June, June 15th will be one of those days that are big negative for the uh, stock market. Let's keep going. Yeah, I don't like doing this either. But then in September, things get positive. Things start to break apart actually in the summer around July of 2025. We start to see slight improvements, but the damage is not over yet. So uh, July of 2025, we start to see improvements. And then by September, October, great, great. Uh, September, October, 2025, God bless America. Things are great again. Whether it's because they turn the printing presses on, things will get good. And July 18th of 2026, will be a big positive day, July 21st of 2026, August 31st, 2026, November 29th, 2026. All those are big positive days for the stock market. So we will end 2026 on a high note, on a high note. And it'll continue into April, uh, April where, you know, not the best, starts to break off a little, but still positive. We're still going to stay positive, still positive until the end of 2027, right around that November 2027. Pluto will conjunct with the North Node and the big negative begins. It'll be in this, uh, November, in December of 2027. August, I mean, April 2028, June 24th, 2028. See, in 2028, we're still going to have some huge negative days. And out of nowhere, like write this date down. You really want to laugh? Write this date down and look back September 24th, 2028 to October 27th, 2028. That stretch that month is going to be hot will be hot for the stock market see we will have good times but then around mid about november 15th the huge negative kicks in and finally the start of 2029th which is january 16th 2029 everything finally starts to separate it'll be 100 years since the 2029 crash here's what i wrote much worse than COVID are my notes. That's what my notes say. Much worse than COVID. By April 29th, 2029, huge, huge negative. By if this is going to last into by December of 2029, December of 2029, right before Christmas, I have in my notes. Huge negative for society and global chaos. Markets will react negatively equals chaotic. 2029 ends with mass chaos. The only comparison we have is 1929. And I even asked, will markets still exist into 2030, 2030? Because by April 2030, the damage will continue. It will still stay bad all of 2030 into uh, into October of 2030 where where Saturn still opposes the north node it's already already set up like perfectly for negative and major chaos globally in that November of 2030 will be ridiculous 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 we will not end it until about 2031 i mean in 2030 to 2030, in, at the end of 2030 and, and through 2031, there'll be ups and downs, but the chaos will not end until 20, end of 2031. The good times, the good times will be after 2033. So if you're around and you have money after that, like if you did the right things, you could have generational wealth. With the crashes that are coming, if you just save your cash and when everyone's running out of the burning building, you run in. Because if this is going to be worse than COVID, let's look at COVID real quick. I know this is sports betting, but this shit matters. Because let's look at COVID real fast. Let's look at these big companies. 
Let's pull up for Amp Apple, for, for instance. March 2020, when COVID, they hit a low of $51. $51. March 2020. Okay. By March, Twenty twenty four, it's at one hundred and eighty dollars. So it went from less than fifty to one hundred and eighty over three x month your money in just four years, three three and a half x. And there's other stocks that you know dumped a lot worse than Apple did. They didn't dump all that bad. That five x, six x, eight x, ten x to your money. But you need to save that capital. You need to save that capital. Those opportunities will come when it becomes worse than COVID. And when it becomes the hardest to buy, that's when you want to buy. See, most people buy when all the hype is, when they're talking about it on CNBC and every commercial is about Bitcoin and that, that, that. Like that's, it's always at the high that they're doing that. It's always at the high. And that's when most people FOMO in. It's that fear of missing out. So instead of that, they want to buy, they buy, they buy, and they just end up buying at all the highs, which is never a good thing. You never want to be the guy that's always buying at the highs and selling at the lows just to get out and cut your losses. And I know that's happened to a lot of us on this right now because it has happened to me as well. So I could be sure of it. Oh boy, yeah, Tesla, keep dropping. Everything is dropping, boy. Wow. The Q's. The queues were over $500 just on July 11th. We're now August 2nd. It's 440. And no one's even talking about it. In fact, CNBC saying how great the economy is. Guys, it's going to get bad. It's going to get bad. Shit's going to get bad. Prep for it. Manage your risk correctly with everything. Live below your means. Live below your means. Like I was telling my girl the other day, when I had finally made money, finally had money, like where I was like, you know what? Not only do I have money stacked in investments, but I also have cash for an emergency. I also have a bankroll and a bankroll behind it, sports betting. Like when I was at my most comfortable and I have multiple incomes, I have UFC income. I had wager talk income. I had the big moves income. I had the sheet income. I had the accounts that I was taking a percentage of income. So I was making all good income at that time too. Not only had saved, but was making a good income. And I was telling my girl, here's what I did. I promised myself that for five years, I was going to live as if none of this was happening. And I was driving a Toyota Camry to the UFC Performance Institute and to the UFC Apex when I could have bought any car I wanted in cash back then. Like not any car, but up to six, up to 100 grand I could have afforded it. And I could have just bought it outright. And it wouldn't have like destroyed me at that time. And I didn't. And I stayed in a Toyota Camry. I stayed in the same 1,800 square foot house with no swimming pool or anything like that. I wore the same clothes. I no Gucci, no Louis Vuitton, no none of that nonsense. I, I acted as if I wasn't making it, didn't have it. I just looked the other way. I kept my expenses the exact same and even looked to lower them. Like, cool, let me cut cable. Let me, I was start seeing that money coming in. Cool, how could I lower more expenses so that my, ROI is even higher. How do I do that? How do I do that? How do I do that? And I did it for five years. I drove that Camry around. I drove it the wager talk when we were freaking taping back then before everything was on Zoom. And I was driving it here in Vegas, going to the, the sports books, not being embarrassed. And people saying, is that Ace? Is that Ace? Is that VR? Dude, I thought he'd have a freaking Benz. I thought he'd have a Benz. I thought he'd have a Beamer. I thought he'd have a Ferrari. I thought that, damn, damn, I didn't care. I didn't care. I said, I'm buying my time. I'm buying my time. My day will come. I'm done doing this of looking rich. 
of pretending I'm rich, of acting like I'm, I'm, I'm have more than I have. Those days are over. Those days are over. I'm now going to wait until I actually do have more than I actually look like I have, not the other way around. And I, that's exactly what I did. And it changed my life forever. But that was the long game. And again, it was something I didn't know how to do, which is why it took me till 40 years old. But I, I pray, I pray it doesn't for you, that you learn quicker that that's the only way. That you're going to have to suck it up, live below your means, and save, save, save. Little by little by little. You're not going to save yourself the wealth, but you're going to save yourself to invest. So then you could invest yourself to wealth. <laughs> Nobody's going to earn themselves to wealth. We don't make enough. Nobody does. Like, it's just not going to happen. You know, like the 001% the zero, zero, do. If you're an athlete, if you're an influencer with a, a Mr. Beast with 8 billion for subscribers or whatever. But the majority of us, that's not going to happen. So we're going to have to make our money the old fashioned way, slow and steady, slow and steady. Let me see if there's any questions, then let's get into some baseball. Thank you, Nate. I just try to tell it like it is, man. I'm trying to keep it real with you guys. And uh, again, life's just, as, as much as this is about sports betting and, and, and having a, a profitable subscription, because that's the goal or else I'm wasting my time and I should just sell picks. Like why make my, my life harder than it needs to be with a weekly steam room, with trying to, you know, answer questions, being available, doing the daily YouTubes. Like truth is I ain't got to do that shit. I just got to put up a package every day and with some good freaking byline on it. I'll make more money than I'm doing trying to, trying to partner, trying to partner with people for a year. Trust me, that's not easy. That's not easy to do. Um, there's a, there's a lot bigger market for a 5% game of the year than, uh, than anything else. All right. Paul asking about passing success rate. You that's one of my greatest uh, correlations to victory in NFL, passing success rate. Is there a way to assign a point value to passing success rate? I think you would have to do proprietary. I think you would have to design one your own, meaning based on the difference in ratings from the top guy, number one, to number 32, what have you taking a number with an arbitrary number, let's say it is one to 32 and they're all separated by just one, by number by one, 1.0, 1.0. Then it would be 1.0, 2.0, 3.0, 4.0, 5.0, 6.0, all the way down to 32, from one to 32. I'm sure that's not how they're differentiating is between success rate, but I think I would start there and I would design my own, my own proprietary point value to passing success rate that's when you're next leveling it and you just may uncover something paul that gives you a little bit of an edge where you spot like wait a minute anytime i have a differentiator of positive five in one team's direction they're a great money line bet or they're a great fade when they're at an, when someone's passing success rate is negative six or greater against their opponent you know what I mean? Like you, I think I think you're on to something because passing success rate is one of my top NFL um, metrics that I use. I've said that before. It's a great. It's as far as predictive metrics, it's one of the best. I think value of replacement is right there too. Um, a little harder to figure that one out on your own, but you're on the right. You're so on the right track with the passing success rate and just how important it is of a metric as far as being predictive goes. All right. Now. Wow. They just keep dropping, huh? I, I sold some Bitcoin last night. I can't lie. Um, 
And my girl's like, Dan, that was smart, right? I wasn't really smart. I mean, the chart told me that it looks like we're it's going down, um, but I got paid in Bitcoin last night. You know, some uh, two of the three of this shit. Yeah, probably more than that now of the agents and uh, outs that I use settle in crypto. Um, Bitcoin, I don't really love settling in because of the volatility. Like you could lose, you lose money on the transaction and the fees and shit. But um, most do USDT, most do uh, Tether. For what reason, I don't know. But most uh, bookmakers, at least uh, the gray line bookmakers, they all southern settle and tether. Damn, Bitcoin's going to drop another leg. Wow. Good job getting out, Ace. Good job getting out. Yeah, right now, honestly, if you're trading right now, you should be trading and day trading in and out of the stock market. I would not be holding anything. The only thing I would look to do is short or maybe pick up some commodities on drawbacks. You know what I mean? Like uranium having a big pullback today. When May 17th, uranium was $60. Now it's down to 40. You know what I mean, it's a huge drop. It's a huge drop. I have my buy set down around $40, 30 something dollars. We back up the truck because that's a trend line going back to March, 2020. The trend line that goes back to COVID for uranium right now, if it got down to 3709 on uranium, it would be a, a hit of a trend line dating back to March, 2020 and a Fibonacci retrace of the uranium top from a few months ago like it's a great great setup to go long to go long um on uranium again gold is doing that someone had asked about buying gold about it being a good time and i said i thought you should wait um because there was that weekly topping tail and you saw they scared us that second day after it where they pushed it up to just a few, a dollar or not even less than overcome uh, that topping tail, negating it. Um, but then they brought it right back down below the topping tail, 50% retrace and below the gap. Like charts just don't lie. Like it wasn't even my opinion. That's what I was trying to explain when I was asked on the daily YouTube about a gentleman who said he wants to get into physical gold, into physical metals. And with gold being near the top, is it a good time or is it just going to keep going up? Should he buy now or should he wait? Will it be a pullback? And I've just pulled up the chart and I said, listen, right now, this was on the 29th. I said, you, we got to wait till the 31st of July. If at the end of this week, which was Sunday, or we get a close that keeps that top and tail alive, we're gold. And then I saw there's a gap as well below it. I said, don't buy. I said, I, I do believe from the 230 high that it was the paper gold. Now 224. And it's probably just going to go lower. It's just the chart. I mean, again, sometimes it takes long to play out because they're not, you know, they could remain irrational a lot longer than we can like you always hear that uh, so i was just uh some bullshit nothing to concern yourself for so yeah that's far as gold that's what i'm doing because i right now i wish i had gotten more uh, you know a year ago i didn't now I'm waiting for the pullback too. I'm, I'm stacking my cash waiting for the pullback. So those of you that are asking about gold, yes, physical gold is the way to go now. Physical, physical, physical gold. You want to buy coins and bars if possible. 
the more you buy, the cheaper it is. And you don't want to buy collector coins or anything commemorative. You just want it to be 99.999 pure. That's it. It doesn't matter because if shit hits the fan, that's all that's going to care. Is, is it gold? Is it gold? Not who's on the, who's on, who's on the coin. No one's going to care. So don't waste extra money for any of that collective stuff. I promise you, I would wait. I would wait on gold. I would look to at least a pullback. Let me see. I'll tell you where I think it pulls back to. Uh, let me do a fib retrace real quick on the monthly. Sorry. You ask, I'll answer. We'll go from December 2022 lows. We'll take it from there. Up to the July highs. All right. All right. So. From the November 2022 low of 1,600 and change, to a July high of 24.83 and change, okay. Oh yeah. Gold has more upside eventually though. I think we retest 2000. I really do. I think gold retests 2000 with a chance. Of 1950 and 1950, right around that 1950 range. But at, at 2000, which is a round number and those matter. Um, yeah, I'd be a buyer. I'd be a buyer of gold at 2000 an ounce. which pisses me off because in March of 2020, it was 1500. In May of 2019, it was 1200. That's gold. Gold isn't going to make you rich overnight, but it's going to maintain your purchasing power while not losing value. See, the dollar continues to lose value and purchasing power. It's lost like 99.9% .9 of its purchasing power since the inception. Just think about it. How many more dollars do you need to buy a car now than you needed 100 years ago? A lot more of them, right? Or even 50 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago. You need a lot more dollars. So they lose their purchasing power when that happens. Um, gold's the opposite. Gold's the opposite. So yeah, I would do that with the gold. All right, let's get into some baseball and I want to give you some of the MMA that I'm looking at because tomorrow's an early MMA card. Who are these people? I don't know. One second, one second. All right, let's get to the baseball. I have a couple sides I want to give you right now. And tell them I'm going to go through each game real fast, okay? So hang with me. All right, nothing on St. Louis Cubs, nothing on St. Louis Cubs. Well, actually, we bet the over earlier, but I'm saying nothing added to St. Louis Cubs. Nothing added to St. Louis Cubs. Gun the head. I like the home dog Cubbies. I like the home dog Cubbies. And we have the over seven and a half. They also went over eight in that game. So it's now sitting at eight and a half at some of the sharper shops. So we placed a good bet there. Win or lose, we placed a good bet. All right. 
next. Let's look at Arizona and Pittsburgh really quickly. Arizona and Pittsburgh really quickly. Nothing to share. Not Arizona and over, Arizona and over. Arizona and over is what I like. Again, nothing I, I'm confirming. I'm going to give you the leans. And let's keep going. Let's keep going. KC Detroit. KC Detroit. This is the one we had a bet in, I'm pretty sure. Yep. KC Detroit, KC Detroit. We're going to go under, under seven, minus 115. It's good up to minus 120. We're going 4%, 4% play on the under. The wage talk system has it at uh, minus 118, so it's good up to 120. Yep, that's what we're going with. So we got KC, Detroit under seven. So I got to put it into. All right, under KC Detroit. That was good. All right, next up, next up, next up. Hold on, things are coming, forgive me. I said, this isn't a show, it's a live trading. All right, so we're gonna go under there. No, nope. let's see how that turns out. Okay, Milwaukee, Washington, Milwaukee, Washington. Not in this report there. Not in the report there. <laughs> no. Toronto Yankees, Toronto Yankees. We do have something to report here. All right. You guys ready for here? We got a couple plays here. You ready? First, we're gonna go Toronto, the Blue Jays, money line, 
plus 140 or better. All right, 3% play, 3% play. And then we're gonna go first five, first five. We're gonna take 2% on the money line. First five money line at plus 125. And then we're also gonna do 2% at plus a half a run. What I didn't do in Colorado yesterday. See, went against even my own and it cost me. And I'm still gonna, not gonna live that down. In my head until after the weekend at least. It's gonna drive me nuts. All right, 2%, first five, first five spread. We're taking plus a half a run, minus 115, also for 2%. In that same game, in that same game, Toronto Yankees. All done. In that same game, Toronto Yankees. Uh, not enough nine and a halves. All right, we're going to hold off on that under Toronto, New York Yankees. So we're going to hold off on that one, but I'm also looking at the under. We're also looking at the under there. Just want to see better lines at nine and a half and need to figure out if that got dummied up for that manipulation move or there actually is some uh, resistance towards that over. Luckily, gate later game, no rush, no rush. We got Toronto out of the way. Let's go San Francisco. Oh, hold on. We have also strong lean right now, San Fran. San Francisco also, we're putting them on the side later game. Now let's look at Baltimore, Cleveland, Baltimore, Cleveland. We already have the under in that one, which I like. Now we're coming in on the home dog, Cleveland. Hey, Cleveland, that's game 968, Cleveland. Three percent play on the money line. At even money. Or better. For three percent. And then we're also taking Cleveland. Plus a half a run for 2% in the first five, plus a half, minus 135, 2%. And also 2%, first five, money line. So I'll repeat them, don't worry. I'll repeat the Cleveland and Toronto bets.
All right. All right. And we're also taking Cleveland 2% on the money line, first five. So just like we did with Toronto, we got money line for the game, 3% Toronto, 3% Cleveland. Then first five, we're breaking down 2% on the money line, 2% on the run line. Since they're both dog, we'll take plus a half a run for some big. We're taking 2% on Cleveland, 2% on Toronto money line, 2% on Cleveland, 2% on Toronto run line. That's first five only. So we got those out of the way. We got the Cleveland under as well. Let's keep going. This is in Miami. No oh, guess. This is in Atlanta. All right. We have a play here, I believe. All right, we'll put that as the lean to the side too. Miami, Atlanta, Miami, Atlanta over. So those are the leans that we have to decide so far that you may see the under in Toronto Yankees, the over in Miami, Atlanta, and also the San Francisco Giants. Those are leans right now. Those are strong leans. Boston, Texas, we don't have anything. White Sox, Minnesota. Mm. Is this in the White Sox? No, it's in Minnesota. All right, we're going to pass nothing there. Tampa, Houston. Good thing is, see, I have all my Pythagorean stuff. I know what I'm looking for real quickly. There's only a couple metrics I need to peek my eyes at, and then I'm good. Mets, Atlanta, Angels, Mets, Angels, Mets, Angels, Mets, Angels, Mets, Angels. And I like angels. I like the angels. Give me the angels. Not going to bet it. Going to put it as a lean. Slight lean right now at home. Slow down, Matt. Slow down. Philly, Seattle. I don't think we got anything there. I think so. Colorado, San Diego. Don't have a bet for you. Are you ready? All right. Colorado, San Diego. Game 962, 962. Colorado, San Diego. We're going to go under. Eight and a half. Under. Eight and a half. Four percent play. Eight and a half minus 20. Eight and a half minus 20. Under eight and a half. Minus 120, 4% play, 
Colorado, baby. Got that under, and finally, Dodgers Oakland. All right, nothing there. So we're good. We got the Colorado in. The under. All right, so we're looking at three possibles, three possibles. What map past trends Pythagorean may not be reflective. I just, what I do is at the half, when it reaches the half way mark, I just circle those teams that I think are gotten a little lucky or unlucky. And I look for spots to fade or follow. I don't expect the regression or progression to happen immediately, but I do look for spots where those teams may be undervalued or overvalued. It's not uh, a reason that I'll blindly bet either, um, but as far as um, being uh, predictive, it's one of the better predictors of future performance that we have for all sports. As far as um, trying to predict future performance of wins and losses, a team that got lucky or unlucky, Right, the the trade deadline it changes for a lot of things, but you got to you got to remember that this the point spread and the money line become the great equalizer. It's not as it, like if you had information about a certain team that no one else has, then it's not baked into the cake. But the fact that this team gave up on the season or this team's trading away players or playing for next year that's baked into the cake. And Toronto is the perfect example of that where look over the last 10 games last weekend when i did wager talk today the talk was how can you bet toronto they're a team that's given up on the season they're a team that's looking to trade um at the trade deadline they're looking to dump players well yeah we know that the market knows that so guess what that probably means they're gonna be a little bit undervalued as far as the price goes i don't need them to win every game if they're an underdog meaning like they're five and five over the last 10. If the market thinks they're so terrible that they're going to price them as a dog every single game because of that, they're turned out being profitable over the last 10 because of that narrative of how this team just quit on the season. And maybe they did, maybe they did. But if they're still able to win a certain amount of games that is higher than the implied price, then they're going to be profitable just like a team could win 80 percent of their games but if their average closing line is minus 450 they're not going to be profitable because the break even is minus 400 at 80 percent so you always got to keep that in mind because if it was as easy as just betting the, the the better team more times than not matt if you're going to look on a paper the favorites almost always going to look better than the underdog like if you just cover the names and just look at the data Nine times out of 10, the favorite's going to look better, especially if it's a favorite of above minus 150, 160, 170, where we're greater than six out of 10 times, seven out of 10 times, we expect team A to be team B. On paper, they're always going to look better. So the, 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 the key is how much better. Like the, the money line and the point spread become the great equalizer. This is why if you look at Major League Baseball, um, let's look at this for uh, today. This is a perfect example. I'm so glad. This is the kind of thinking I love. That's Matt. That's the kind of next level thinking I love. I live for for this these conversations. 
Okay, here's here's what I'm talking about. Here's the example that I mean. Bup, 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 bup. Right now, Houston Astros, Houston Astros, they're number, they're they're in first place in the American League West. Okay, they're above 500. They're a few games above 500. They're the best team in the West, but we've you've lost money betting them, like that the markets priced them so well that even though they've won more games than they've lost, they're down money where uh, a team like Washington, Washington's 11 games under 500. And yet you've made more money betting Washington this year than you did betting Houston. If you bet $100 on every Houston game and $100 on every Washington game, you'd be up six or 700 betting Washington. You'd be down seven or 800 betting Houston. That's like a $1,500 swing just between those two teams. And we know Houston's better than Washington, but that becomes the great equalizer. That's what you got to keep in mind, that the market's created to eliminate any kind of value on what seems obvious. Where even if that team wins, they're going to misprice it so that it was a bad bet that won. And I talk about that all the time. Bad bets win all the time, all the time, just like good bets lose all the time. Right now, I'll keep using the same analogy. As I am saying this, someone down the street from my house, I have two casinos within five minutes of where I'm at. Someone right now just hit a number on roulette. They put $10 on a number. They got $350 back. They're jumping up and down. They're high-fiving their wife, and they're walking away saying, Fucking A, what a great bet. What a great bet number 22 turned out to be. Number 22 was a terrible bet. I'm very happy that that gentleman or that lady got 35 to 1 on their money. It's amazing. God bless them. But the true odds are 38 to 1. We know that because of the amount of spaces on a roulette wheel. There's at least 37. Now in most places, there's 38. So if he's getting paid 35 to 1, even though he won that bet, it wasn't a good bet. It was negative EV all day because he's getting 35 to one on a 38 to one proposition. Now, if they were paying him 40 to one on that number and he put it on 22 and 23 came out, he placed a great bet, a much better bet than the one prior. And even though he lost this one, if he continues to make this one, he will be profitable. He'll be up on the casino. If he makes the other one and continues to make it, he will lose his money and be down on the casino over time. See, unless you're only betting once and never again, the price matters more than the outcome. If you're only betting today, if you're only betting that fight, that game, then the only thing that matters is picking the right side. That's all that matters. The line move doesn't matter. How much closing value, line value you get doesn't matter. You don't have to analyze none of that stuff. You don't have to determine whether you placed a good bet or not. You don't have to determine whether you got CLV, what percentage of CLV, how big of an edge you had going into the game before the first pitch. None of that matters. The only thing that matters is, did you win this bet? Because you're never going to bet again. So that's the only thing that matters. It isn't about EV. But if you're going to bet again tomorrow and the day after that and the week after that, the month after that, the year after that, then you better simply be looking for good bets. Because if you keep placing bad bets, you will lose. Just like that roulette wheel, that guy that won 35 to 1. If he sits there and keeps betting, they will take his money, which is why they're allowing him to play. But if they were at 40 to 1, then he'll, he's a mathematical certainty to be profitable. The other way around, he's a mathematical certainty to lose money. He happened to defy probability, but you can't defy probability forever. You can only do it for a short amount of time. And you see it every day with a hot handicapper who's defying probability. They're 13 and two over the last 15. What do you think? They're going to hit 90% the rest of their life. Are you kidding me? No, they're defying probability. And you expect that to end. No one's going to be able to defy probability forever. It's just not possible. 
So we got to always keep those things in mind. Always keep those things in mind when we're betting because it's not about betting, finding who the better team is or who's going to win this game. It's about finding a mispriced game where the implied win probability of team A is higher or lower than what it should be. That's it. What's going to happen is going to happen. The pitcher may have a good day, may have a bad day. The umpire may be thinking about dinner and not see that third called strike, and the next one is a three-run homer that changes the outcome. Or he may not see a guy that slid in the second base or whatever, and even the replay was muffled, what have you. It could be so many things can happen over the outcome of a three-hour game, just like a fight. I could see things perfectly, and we all can see the fight perfectly as fighter A won, but then there's three judges that are going to determine that. And if those three, if two of the three judges just decide, no, you know what? I think fighter B won, then it doesn't matter if the rest of the world saw fighter A won. Those three guys are going to determine it for all of us. That's what we got to keep in mind. So the only thing we can do is place good bets and trust that in time, it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And that's produce a profit. And the numbers won't lie to you. When you zoom out, you'll be able to know, was I placing good bets when you look back? You won't know that when you're making them, except when you determine closing line value, if you have that. Otherwise, you won't know. But you will know after 1,000 of them or 2,000 of them because you'll know your results. And after a statistically significant sample size, you can outrun the truth. The numbers will speak loudly. If you're down after 3,000 bets, you're probably not a profitable better. If you're down after 6,000 bets, you're definitely not a winning better. It's, you're, you're, you're definitely not a favorite to uh, be able to do it again, to, to win in your next 3,000 or what have you. Um, let me see. Before we get into some MMA, I want to do some MMA for you guys, get you out ahead because it's 9 a.m. tomorrow. That's why we're not even going to have a video tomorrow. It's 9 a.m., 9 a.m. Sorry, trying to look for something. All right. Okay. Does consistently beating CLV get you limited or banned on books? Do you ever place negative EV bets to loosen the ropes? Great question. And yes, that's exactly what's going to get you dropped. You're, the money you won or lost becomes irrelevant. In fact, I, I talk about this example all the time. Um, you know, I get accounts from guys a lot, and, and there's a handful of guys that I trust to give me solid accounts. Well, one of them gives me an account, and I place three baseball bets. And again, keep in mind, we're having a terrible baseball season, right? I place three baseball bets. Within 15 minutes of placing them bets, I get a text and it says, hey, that uh, account is getting shut off. Um, they're going to honor the three bets you placed, but that's it. I think I went one and two or two and one. Won a little or lost a little. I just, I think we won a little. And I just told him to hold it to keep it himself. Or we lost a little and he told me to, don't worry about it. I'll cover it. One or the two it was just a real small number. But what happened was this book saw that we laid minus 115 and eventually immediately it went to 122 and then 124, then 126 is where it closed. We went over eight and a half minus 20. It closed eight and a half over minus 20. You know, we took the run line plus one and a half at minus 115. It went to minus 127, then 131 where it closed. He saw that. That's all he needed to see. Didn't matter to him what was going to happen at the end of the night, whether we were going to go 3-0 or 0-3 oh, was irrelevant to him. What he saw was that we had the edge. Because if you're constantly beating the closing line, you're a mathematical certainty to turn a profit. Let me explain why. Because there is no argument against it. The closing line is the most accurate reflection we have of true win probability. Here's why. 
Now, keep in mind, the book may shade it towards biases, meaning they believe the line should be minus seven. That's accurate, but they know everybody's going to bet the favorite at minus seven. So why should they give it to them at, at the fair number? Let's put it out at minus seven, minus 120, or let's put it out at seven and a half or better. Let's put it out at eight. Okay. So what? A couple of sharps will see that and they'll come in and take the plus eight, but we'll have more than enough on minus eight to overcome that. You see that all the time. Okay. All the time. But if you're constantly beating the close, here's why you are a lock, a lock to turn a profit long term, because the closing line has all the information factored in. Let's not forget when they bring out the lines for the NFL for college football next week, they bring them out Sunday during Sunday night football. Let's say we don't know yet who's injured 100 percent, who's playing, who's not playing, what exact weather is going to be that day. We don't know any of those things. We can speculate, but we don't know for certainty. We do on that day. All the information has been factored into the betting line. All the ingredients are baked into the cake. At least as many as possible. By the time the game's ready to kick off, we know everything. We know who's starting. We know who's sitting. We know who's injured. We know what the coach said during the week. We, we know what the weather is. We know, is it going to rain in two hours? Is it not going to rain? Is it going to be windy? Will it be cold? Will it be warm? We know all those things. We don't know them six, seven days out. So if you're able to get ahead of the market, obviously you're going to be profitable. That just makes sense. And in fact, we could even calculate your exact edge before the game starts based on your CLV. You get down to minus 110, the game closes minus 125. You know exactly what your, your edge is. And you know that you place the plus EV bet. No one could argue that. It's again, it doesn't even come down to opinion. It comes down to math. So that's where, you know, I don't know why people even argue that. Um, now, yes, I have, I do. There's, I, I have minimal accounts now. Luckily, I have good long-term accounts. I'm able to bet big money. They honor it. But uh, uh, new ones, I do that all the time where I, I, I cool them off and I'll throw it. Like uh, my girl's going to put in a parlay tomorrow's UFC. I got in, you know, I got new accounts coming for college football and NFL. It's that time of the month where people start giving me accounts. There's two or three accounts I'm going to hand there until I go put your MMA shit through here this weekend because she bets MMA now. So put your parlay in through that one, put your straight bets in through that one, put your props in through that one. Let them see some negative EV shit. Let them see some of that. And then we'll bombard them with the sharp shit later. Yeah, I do that all the time. I'll do that when I'm up a lot on an account. I'll look to put in some middles in that account. Even if I pay VIG, like I'll take minus three and a half here, plus three and a half there and give the minus. If I, if I think the plus three and a half is the right side, I'll give the minus three and a half on the book that I'm up, up that week and the goodbye that I'm, you know, maybe even at or down. I'll give him the right side and hope to win that side, hope to lose this side. I do that all the time. And in fact, me and Andrew Gombis, we talked about this a few weeks ago. I work with him uh, on a daily basis. And uh, we were going into Sunday and we were up a lot of money on this new account. It was a live betting account um, that we were destroying with some live betting shit. Anyway, we were actually talking Sunday morning and I'm like, I hope we get buried today in that fucking account. He's like, that's dude, I can't believe he said that. He's like, I was just thinking the same thing. I really hope we lose today to, that, to him so we could, you know, get paid or not get cut off. Yeah, it happens all the time, man. I can't believe it that you tell that the most recreational bettors are going to be like, are you nuts? Seriously? Like it's hard enough to win, but you're actually hoping to lose some days. Not hoping to lose for the day, but hoping to lose what I put into that account because I'm not putting everything through every account. I'm putting through the numbers on like one account. I may only get one of the bets in with him today because that's the only number that was available. I don't bet bad numbers. If I'm looking for minus 108 and he has minus 109, guess what? He's not getting the bet. The guy that gave me 108 or 107 is getting it. So there's some books I'm not, might not have all the pieces in, but I, I'm hoping I'm going to lose with him those pieces today. So that happens all the time. Um, now, great question here from M. He says, what are my thoughts on Kelly betting? Listen, Kelly criteria is a mathematical formula that you can't argue against because it's just math. And it shows what you should bet, your exact bet, based on your edge. 
all the way down to zero. So what you should bet based on your bankroll and the edge. And as your bankroll decreases or increases, based on the Kelly criteria, your bet size will increase or decrease and based on your edge. Here's the problem that I have with Kelly because I use Kelly. I use Kelly for blackjack. Um, and we're actually more or less using Kelly now for sports betting. But what I've learned to do is bet a quarter Kelly or a half Kelly, even less than a half a Kelly. So whatever the Kelly criteria shows, cut it in half. Whatever the Kelly criteria shows, cut it in quarters. That's what I did for blackjack. And that's what's turned out best for us. When we tried going full Kelly, it was chaos. It was so much volatility, no one could handle the swings. The swings were so intense that we were actually, we lost money. We lost money when we shouldn't have. Um, and that's when we learned that most groups that used Kelly, they used the quarter Kelly to avoid, to, to survive the volatility and overcome the volatility that comes with betting Kelly. Um, Cause you're going to deal with that for sure. So I highly, highly recommend using Kelly criteria as a betting strategy, but I would recommend going the quarter Kelly. You'll do, you'll do great. You'll do great. Um, just go quarter Kelly. You'll sleep better. The volatility and fluctuations will be less. The roller coaster ride won't be as, as hectic. Um, you'll do so much better going quarter Kelly on so much better. Um, that, that worked the best. Um, for us, that's for sure. Yeah, it's a great business model. You're right. You know, just it's the only better business model, honestly, than bookmaking, which is it's funny. I, I bump into people when I'm out and about sometimes, and they're always nice. Most times they come up, they introduce themselves. Um, we'll take a picture even, you know, that's always fun. I love doing that. Um, but they always ask me, how do I get into it? What do you, What should I do? What do you think is the best way to become a winning sports better to get in the sports betting industry. What do I do? I tell them, listen, you're at the best time to get in, break in the sports betting industry. The very best time. It is as mainstream as it comes and it's only getting bigger. So there's more money to be made in sports betting than anything else right now. The problem is there's only a few entities that profit from the sports betting market. They are. They are. The betting syndicates, the betting syndicates, they are, hold on, something's coming in. The bookmakers, the bookmakers, and the scalpers, the scalpers. Everyone else is losing. Everyone else is the 99.5% that loses. So I tell them, you're going to do one of two, one of three things. You either want to book, become a bookmaker. And they always say, book, how am I going to do that? How do I do that? Don't you have friends that bet? Don't you know people that bet? Hang around a sports bar. Hang around a sports book. You'll see nothing but sports bettors. Before you know it, you're talking to people. Say, I have accounts. Give small credit. Don't get burned. Learn the bookmake at the small level. Build your book gradually, slowly. Get to a sheet where you got 10, 20 good players. Then allow a sharp guy in there. For every 20 squares, you want one sharp. 20, 25 squares, you want one sharp. You want to offset that money. Get it to 50 players, you'll never have to work again. Get it to 100 players, you'll be wealthy. That's it. You want to break in that way. It's two. Two. Become a wise guy, which means have the ability yourself to lay 11 to 10 and be profitable have a bankroll to bet that action and a network to help get you down. If you can do that, that's another way. If you can't do it that way, then provide accounts for those guys like I did and I'm doing that way or scout. With the amount of sports books that are available to you, anybody can scout. You can place plus EV bets all day scalping. Plus EV bets all day day scalping those are the three that's what i offer all right what else what else do we have here
respectfully disagree. Problem with Kelly, there's no way to predict your edge. I don't understand how, what do you mean you can't predict your edge, Neil? Before every hand of blackjack, you know your edge. As long as you know how many cards are in the discard tray, how many cards the dealer's holding, what the true count is, you know your exact edge before you place your bet. Every single bet you place, you have your edge. For sports betting, it's a little harder before you place your bet because you're not going to know your CLV. But before the game starts, you know it if you have CLV. Otherwise, you have a big sample size. Look over your last 2,000 bets. See what your ROI is based on the amount of money you bet and determine what your edge is long term. And that's your average edge per bet. And Kelly bet it. But because it fluctuates from bet to bet within a few percentage points, even if you're very accurate, you go quarter and you overcome all that volatility. That's my understanding as far as what I've learned in the years of, of, of betting, where I could with confidence determine what my edge is. Um, where else? Who else? Okay, great question, Ernesto. Should I wait until we are back even for the year to start of 2025 to add more? My bankroll, should I do it whenever the, the rate adjusts accordingly, even though we are down? For example, if I start it with 33, my bankroll, even though, say I added 5K, it's now operating with 38 for adjusted unit size or just hold off until we are back? I, honestly, I would wait. I would wait, Ernesto. I would hold off. Or I would hold off until you get back like over 40. You know what I mean? Then you see we're running back into that positive way and then invest into it and then put more of capital into your um, overall bankroll. But I would be in no rush to do it right now. Um, I would just keep grinding, keep staying that same percentage We'll get back to 40 and then you could assess, do I add it to five and, and so that I'm, you know, um, going to 40 betting as if I have 45, but because you shouldn't really, you are not really adjusting to increase or decrease 50% or the new year, I would do that. I would see how we do and ride this out through the end of the year. Hopefully we do what we did last year and we end 2024 with profit and then you could add that five that you have or um with whatever you do with the profit for this year if that's the case between now and the end of this year in the meantime i would tie up that five thousand in something where i'm guaranteed interest ernesto like in a coinbase if you put it in usdc they'll give you five five and a half percent now i know that's not great but it's free money that's just sitting there why why you know what i mean if, if you're if you don't need it um, as capital for anything, lock it into something that's getting you 5% on your money over time. It's free money. It's free money. And then January 1st, we reassess. We reassess. And between now and then, too, Ernesto, we're here every week. We'll see how it's going and we'll, we'll approach, we'll please ask every week. I just think right now, there's no reason to. I like what I see over the last seven days. I like what I see. As far as the preparation for NFL and college football, I like how prepared we are with the groups that I'm working with, how they already sent me a bunch of college football. They already sent me NFL. Um, I like how they're already sending me more money from back east because they're expecting to want to get down a lot more out here. Um, so everything's pointing to me. I'm getting really excited for what's ahead, um, but I, I don't want to like tout it too much, if that makes sense. Like I'd rather undersell and overperform than oversell and underperform. You know what I mean? Um, but I'm very confident in these next five months, as you can see, I'm extremely, extremely um, optimistic. And I think the optimism comes from the history. The truth is it does. The, 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 the optimism just comes from the history. Um, Ernesto, that's where you're going to get to. I probably, here's what's crazy. Here's what's going to happen to you so you understand because this is what's happened to me. You're going to be grinding like this and be like, am I doing the right thing? 
you know, yeah, I'm, I'm up a little bit, but should I have done this with my money instead? Would I be making more if I actually put that 40,000 in, in there? I was, this is what I was saying. I was back then, this is my head. I was like, should I really, should I put 20 and 20 into like a $150,000 condo and have with the tenant already? And they could have been renting those out. Should I have done this? That's what I was thinking. Went off that 40,000. I'd only made like 4,000, 5,000, 8,000. And I was like, you know, is that, or then I was down four or five, 8,000. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing, Yanni? What are you doing? But I, I told myself, you promised yourself that you're going to give yourself at least five years without looking up. You were going to do this the right way for five years and see after that where you stand. Well, what happened was I got a little lucky because I got hot immediately when I started. And then when I cooled off, I didn't let it, I didn't do the wrong things. I didn't chase. I didn't do anything. I just kept betting the right size. But then out of nowhere, like uh, my third year was one of those where we had a crazy, where we'd like increased bet bankroll by like three X. It was like the most insane NFL season, the most insane March madness, like college basketball season and baseball where like all three of those won soccer and NASCAR won and like MMA won. And we increased, like if you had started with a 50,000 bankroll, you three X it, you had 150 at the end. That's what happened to me where that 40,000 at the end of year one, it was 48,000 at the end of year two, it might've been like 52,000, 55,000. And then all of a sudden it was 150,000, just like that. Like the following year it went to 150,000. I was like, oh shit. Yeah, you're doing the right thing. You're doing the right thing. You just don't know when that run is going to come, but you know it's going to come just from the history and just how the math plays out when you have that type of edge. Unfortunately, it doesn't come in, in increments. It comes in swings. Like it, it, I wish it came in where every 100 bets we win 55, we lose 45, win 55, lose 45. Because even with the VIG, we'll be picking up five units every 100 bets. 55 and 45, add five for the VIG. So we'd be 50 and 50, 55 and 50. We pick up five units, right? Every 100 bets. That would be amazing. That we know every 500 bets, we're up 25 units. Every 1,000 bets, we're up 50 units. Every 2,000 bets, we're going to be up 100 units. Every 4,000 bets, we're going to be 200 units. So all we have to do is keep doing that over and over and over. That is what we're doing. It just doesn't come in that order. Like it comes just like it did for Apple, just like it did for Google, just like it did for Berkshire Hathaway, where they'll have decent months, they'll have losing months, but then they'll have that takeoff month too, where you have two, three straight winning months like Berkshire Hathaway did, like BlackRock did just recently when it went up from what? November 2023 from $600 to 860 this week. So 50% increase in less than 12 months because it just, it just shot up. That's how sports betting has... Oh, oh, worked for me and most of the groups I work with, the guys that I get to talk to that are in the position I am, do the same job I am, they all say it's happened the same way for them, the exact same way. So it just appears like, you know, when it, talking about markets, it's like grind, 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 rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, rinse, repeat, then boom. And just like sometimes it's the negative. All right, Ernesto, how would you approach free bonus bets to lock up profit? Well, I I usually like to use them on bets that I like, like just make a, I would be able to place a bigger bet for free. I looked at it like that. You know what I mean? He could try to middle it. They try to scalp it. Um, but I don't really, because I don't use all like those kind of books, like most of my, 95% of the action I do is with local books. And with them, I don't get free bets. I get rebates and um, percentage of money bet. 
as a rebate. Um, so I don't really have a, like any technique or formula to say take advantage of free bets in this way. I don't want to lead you down the wrong way if there is an advantage play to free bets because I'm sure there are. I'm sure there's plenty of guys that are taking advantage of um, advantage play. I know back in the day I was working with a, a room that we would just took care advantage of bonuses actually. That was the job. It was taking advantage of sportsbook bonuses. That was back in like 2000, 2001, 2002. Wow, it's now 20 plus years ago. Dude, sportsbook bonuses were given like 100% reload bonuses, 200% sign up bonuses. So they were given so much free money. This uh, one really sharp group decided to open up a bonus room and they just rented a house in Green Valley and had like 10, 15 dudes in there just getting accounts to get those bonuses and rolling bonuses over, rolling bonuses over, rolling them, rolling them, rolling over. But what happened is eventually most of the money got tied up in one book and then that book ended up screwing them. And like all that prop that they had made, that one book, they had like 225,000 sitting in there, like a quarter million dollars almost, 240. And that book just told them go kick rocks, like Johnny says. And what's the recourse? Nothing they could do. So all that work, like two years of work, all that headache of moving money, this and that, and they got buried. So I don't know why I just told you that story, other than just to explain, I really don't have an advantage play for bonus bets, but I would personally, I would use it to unload on the ones I like feel strongest of for. Like my 4% and 5%, I would just fire more on top of it. Hey, Sherlock, we're on the same page. We're on the same page. There's absolutely no reason after that many bets that you shouldn't be profitable if you're just following along the same blueprint. Absolutely. Take a picture of that. Uh, click it. Save it. Post it. Give it to me. DM it to me. I love it. We're on the same page, Sherlock. We're on the same page, brother. That's why I started this subscription, and that's why I have the Steam Room. So I can face my subscribers week in, week out, month in, month out, year in, year out, where there is recourse, where you can tell me, boo, this is where I'm at. I've been with you this long. I'm this much money up, this much money down. What's up? Not too many cappers you could do that to. Most will just block you on social media after they have your money. I'm not doing that. I'm going to walk us to the finish line. I did it eight of the nine last nine years. I'm going to do it again. I just can't predict every what year is going to be. Like I said, I've just been straight with you guys and let you know that we have won more years than we should have. That's just the truth. Like if you, out of 10 years, if you're at minus 110, you're lucky if you have six winning years, four losing years out of 10 years. I'm hoping it's because um, it's we bet multiple markets, multiple sports, not just minus 110 sports. So we're able to profit even when we're not 500 or even when we're below 500 because of the plus money and because of the vast amount of volume. I believe we've been able to overcome that because we're staying in statistical significance most of the time. So we're staying within this, that standard deviation of where we should be most times. Um, but there are times where we're further out. And this is just one of those times. And on the on the flip side, the good part of it is for me, selling wise, like when it gets hot, that like uh, people are just going to jump on because the hot streak's going to come. And then over this next four month period, like let's say the next four months, I'm really hot. Now, when I look back over the last 365, they'll be up. Like that changes very quickly, Sherlock, very quickly as far as profit and loss goes. Because we're able to fire multiple markets, multiple volume. I love the um, the tone. I love the tone of your comment. And uh, it's something that I strive for, I promise you. I love that that's how you're thinking of it. That's how I would look at it exactly. And that gives me something that for you, at least you as a subscriber, I need to produce. That's just the truth. That's why I'm telling you, save that, clip it, DM it to me, because I love it. I love it. I love it. All right. All right, Jeff.
Yes, thank you, thank you, thank you. Yeah, definitely on the radar. Um, I, I saw the weigh-ins too, it's gone our way. I just get, gotta see what that line does tonight. This one's over in UAE. Those guys got money, you gotta remember that. It's kind of like when Pacquiao fought. When Pacquiao used to fight, there was so much money in Asia that came in on Pacquiao. You knew you would have a scout even at high money line. That's almost never possible. You could almost never scout minus 400s, minus 500s, minus 600s because their implied win probability is so high. How much it, more is it going to adjust? Like the difference between a minus 600 and minus 700 is almost nothing. It's like what, 1% implied win probability? But the difference between an even money, a minus, uh, plus or minus 100, and a minus 200 is 17% in implied win probability. That's a huge difference. So when you get into that high chalk, that's why they don't become scalpable. But so much of that rich Asian money and Middle East money was going on Pacquiao because he was Filipino, had that fan base, um, that it didn't matter. All you had to do is bet Pacquiao when the line came out. And more times than not, you had an easy scout. Didn't matter the opponent, you had an easy scout. Definitely in the Asian markets, 100% um, with that. But I, I will, that's the only thing I haven't fired the 5%. And actually tonight, Jeff, you guys should get uh, most of the UFC card. Definitely tomorrow morning early, the remainder of the UFC card. And I'm going to give you right now what we're looking at. All right, Jeff, is there a cutoff line on favorites? My local Indian casino cannot always get there in time. And most of the time, the line is a little less plain. But I guess the question is, when do you know when the pass, even if that much off the line you gave? Yep, great question, Jeff. And I'll, I'll answer it again. This is one I've answered before. Um, so it definitely, it doesn't mean I don't want to answer it. It just means that it's obvious question that many of you have. So please take it that way. Go to Google and you're going to Google money line conversion, two words, money line conversion. What's going to pop up? Boyd bets at the very top, Boyd bets. And it's going to say money line conversion chart, win percentages, win percentage calculator and conversion table. And that's going to tell you what the implied win probability is for every money line. So for example, what's a minus 280 favorite? Oh, that's 73.7% break even. What's a minus 240? That's 70.6% break even. What's a minus 185? That's 64.9% break even. Here's why I bring that up, Jeff. If you have this chart near you, I have it. I always keep it up on my computer screen. Not if I am uh, was out, I actually have it on my computer too, on my phone. Otherwise, I'm saying you could print this out. You could keep it in front of you. Most numbers, you'll start to remember them. You'll start to remember like a minus 375%, minus 400 is 80%. So, you know, between three and four is between 75 and 80. You'll be able off the top of your head to figure most of those out and come within a few percentage points. But it'll tell you exactly accurately what the difference is. And here's what you want to look at. How much has the implied win probability changed? Here's what I mean. Let's say I give you a minus 160. And it's now 180. So it's gone 20 cents from 160 to 180. The break even or the implied win probability for minus 160 is 61.5. The implied win probability for 180 is 64.3. So that's almost a 3% increase in implied win probability. That's how much it's changed from 160 to 180. 20 cents, 3% in implied win probability. Now let's go from a minus. 300 to a minus 320. A minus 300 is a 75% break even. A minus 320 is a 76.2. So just a little over 1%. 20 cents on a lower number is 3% change in implied win probability. 20 cents on a higher chalk is only 1% in implied win probability. I would not, everyone's risk tolerance differs. But I would stay within a percentage or two of the implied win probability because you have to factor in how big is our edge. If we're going after 4% edges, 5% edges, 
and they're actually just, you know, we're, we're aiming for 5% or 4% or that's after the VIG because you got to overcome the 4.5% VIG. So let's say after the 4.5% VIG, we're like, ah, we could, we got about a 4% above that. Let's say we're a little bit wrong and it's a more like 3.5% or, 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 or 3% is what the edge is then that's why you don't want to go too far off one or two you want that's how you're going to make sure you're still in the plus ev spot once you start moving three four five percent now you're going to question am i just hoping to be a product of good luck where now it's not about placing a good bet now it's about the outcome the bet don't matter anymore the outcome is the only thing that matters i try to make it to where the only thing that matters is the bet not the outcome and what I mean is if I bet a minus 300 and I, in MMA and I look up and it goes off at minus 400, I won. I won. My job's done. As a sports better, as a winning sports better, as an advantage sports better, as a profitable sports better, my only job is that. To place good bets. And I've just proven that I placed a good bet because I beat the implied win probability by over 5%. The job's done now. Now they got to go out and do their job as a team or as a fighter. I can't do that for them. I could only do this part of it. Can't do all of it. You can't ref it. You can't judge it. You can't play it. You can't fight the other guy. They got to do all that part. You can't train. You can't coach. None of that shit. The only part you could do is the bet part. And that's how you'll know. Did you place a good bet? Did you not place a good bet? You got if you laid minus 150, where the break even 60%, and right now it's minus 180, where the break even 64.3. You got almost a five, four and a half percent edge. And implied win probability. Your job's done. You did your job. You crushed it. You're a lock to be profitable if you could do that over and over and over again. That's the job. So keep that in mind. Keep that in mind. In the short term, it won't materialize always. It won't matter much. In the long term, it's the only thing that matters. It will differentiate and determine whether you're profitable or not. If you keep taking bad numbers, you can't win. If you keep over betting your edge, you can't win. There are so many obstacles that have resulted in 99.5% of anyone that's ever placed a bet on sports to have negative lifetime earnings. That's a fact. So it's a very hard ask to beat these guys, but it's doable. But to do it, everything you do must reflect the winning better. Like you can't, there is no room for error. There's no room for action bets there's no room for pizza bets there's no room for shit like that that's going to eat up any edge you have do it right or don't do it do it for fun there's nothing wrong with doing it for entertainment nothing wrong at all oh man i right, gotta go over mma real quick things are happening ace gotta get back on there gotta get the work Oh, it's Friday too. We got to settle today with a lot of people. Ah, batteries dying. All right, all right. Let's go. I'll give you some of that quick MMA. And then we can wrap this up. Here's what I was looking at. Because I want to look at the PFL real quickly too. It goes off today. And there's even LFA tonight. All right, UFC, you ready? Did I tell you guys about the crazy parlay last week? Did I get a chance to tell you guys about the parlay? Last week, I told you, my girl puts in a parlay, right? I, I told her just straight bet. You want to make money, straight bet, straight bet, straight bet. I said, if you're going to put a parlay, put it in like a lottery ticket. Like money you, you, you expect to lose, like you put in the mega bucks. And if you catch lightning in a bottle, be thankful. So what she does is she straight bets like $100 to $200 on the fighter sides. 
and then she'll put in a parlay, like a $20, $25 parlay with every almost every fight that she likes. And sometimes if she likes like two or three really strong and their favorites, she won't straight bet them. She'll just put in a three fighter parlay. I tell her, don't do that. If they're not strong enough or you don't think there's enough value to straight bet them, there's not enough value to parlay them, but she's learning. She's learning. Anyway, what does she do? She picks every single fight last week and puts in a $25 parlay. First one wins, second one wins, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth. She starts saying, are you, oh my God, look this. What do I do? I said, do you not, relax, relax. There's nothing to do. Just don't, I don't want your heart to break. Just hope you hit your straight bets. You already hit two of them. You got two more and you even have a parlay live. She hits the third bet after like the ninth or 10th win. And I'm like, dude, she's like, oh my God, I can't believe this. And I swear to you, I could show you right now. It was for like 140 dimes. No lie, 140 dime parlay. Um, and I tell her, listen, if you hit this next one on Patty, Patty to Batty, you're gonna win guaranteed a dime because she hit her four straight bets and she hit her parlay. I said, then you have that free roll. So cheering Patty, cheering Patty. Anyway, Patty the Batty, we see what he does. Oh, Patty the Batty does his job like Patty the Batty should, right? She's like, what do I do? I said, babe, listen to me carefully. Do you want to guarantee yourself at least 5,000 to 75,000? Or do you want to go for 140 dimes? Because you have two fights to go, but here's the problem. One of them, you have Curtis Blades, and he's about a plus 300 dog, which means you expect him to win, to lose three out of four times. And then you have uh, Leon Edwards, who I do not think is a good bet. Not enough that he should change your opinion, but I'm on Leon Edwards. So, I mean, on the on Bala. So, let you know there's sharp money against you. I said, so here's the position you're in. You could roll the dice. You have a $25 bet that's about to win 140 dimes. You just need two more fights to come in. Or I can hedge this by getting down 25,000, 20, 25,000 on Aspinall. And then if he loses, we'll re hedge again in the main event. So, I could guarantee you. Five, between 5,000 and 70,000 because we're going to have to hedge half of that if the if Blades does win this fight. So she thinks on it for a second. She's just like, that's a lot of money. 5,000 is a lot of money. She's like, 75 would be great, but 5,000 is a lot of money. Take it. So what I do, I say, I, I, put, I bet 5,000 on uh, Aspinall for her. And uh, I had my boy in Philly. Get some down at an even better price. He got her down at like 370. I got some guys out here to get her some money down at 375. So they actually got her a good price on Aspinall for that 5,000. Um, we split it up. And I said, hey, be on, be on aware. If uh, Blades wins this fight, I'm probably going to need, you know, 40,000 um, at least on Bala. I said, and they're like, all right, no problem, no problem. So, uh, you know what happened? Aspinall wins. And today I just sent her over 5,000 in USDC because I got paid in tether from uh, the books that we pay beat. And she locked up, she made five grand. Like, sure, she could have let the dice roll and it would have been, ah, you lose $25, big deal. But and she could have went for 100 plus K. But that was the move. And so many advantage bettors, wise guys are going to say that was stupid. She had so much equity. Don't give up equity when you have them by the balls. Dude, I live in the real world where people have bills, where the economy is only going to get worse, where we're about to hear the R word recession. And we may even already be in that, which we know what comes after recession, depression. Yeah. Take your money when you could lock it in. So she did that, picked up five dimes. God bless you. Great picking last week. That girl did. Um, hopefully she does some damage this week. All right, so let's go through these real fast. I love Nurmagomedov. I love Nurmagomedov in the main event. I love Umar. I, Sanhagen's got the, the credentials over potential, but trust me, the potential of Nurmagomedov hasn't even shown yet. He hasn't been active enough. Number one, and he's coming off a little recency bias against an opponent. He should have demolished that he didn't. So I love Umar. I love Umar. Co-main event, 
I'm not baiting a Shara. I'm not baiting Shara Bullet. No way. No way. But this is a bad matchup for him. It's a bad matchup because Ole Sejic has pop. He's got pop in his hands, and Shara gets hit. He, he gets hit, and his cardio isn't the best. So I, I think Shara wins. I'm a huge Shara Bullet fan. Um, I just love the guy for whatever reason. But I couldn't bet him. It's dogger pass all day. Dogger pass all day. All right. Vera Figueredo. I love Marlon Vera. Usually I would avoid an, a fighter who's coming off losing a title fight because you reach the pinnacle. You lose. It's only a letdown. You can only have a letdown now. But you ain't going to have a letdown against Figueredo coming in. And all the hype with Figgy, let's not forget, he's moved up to 135 pounds. Okay? He's looked good to date. But I think that, that the weight difference will become more and more evident, especially against a guy who comes on hard late. So, you know, he's got that cardio, has that takedown defense, and is going to just keep throwing. Yeah, give me Vera all day. Ferguson, Kiesa, listen, this fight was supposed to take place years ago. Kiesa was a much smaller favorite. So this line's way inflated, way inflated. But why shouldn't it be? Ferguson's lost seven straight fights, so you haven't gotten rich betting him lately. With that said, the line's just way too high. It's Ferguson or pass. It's dog or pass. The problem is Kiesa is going to win this fight because we know what the weakness for Tony is, and if Kiesa gets, takes his back, it's over. I mean, and that's exactly what he's going to do. All right, Dern Godinez. This one's a tough fight, very tough fight. I almost want to say coin flip so you take the plus money, but I just don't think so. I think there's a little recency bias anti-Dern. And I think this is a very winnable fight for her. Anything less than minus 150, I think she's the right side. Easily six out of 10 times she wins this fight. Brenner Alvarez, I'm, I'm high on Joel Alvarez. Um, he's got a ton of momentum on his side. He's got a solid strength of schedule. Uh, I like him over Brenner. There's two-way wise guy action. Definitely two-way two, two -way uh, wise guy action on that one. Menafield and Merzikhanov. Merzikhanov should win this fight for sure. It's where it's being fought is a huge advantage for him. Uh, but it's, it's just too high of a price against Menafield. You definitely don't want to be uh, laying that type of, of chalk against someone with the pop of, of, of Menafield. And the ability to win at the UFC level like Menafield has. So I, I like the Menafield side. Um, next, next Fernandez and Yaya. Yeah, yeah, Fernandez wins that fight easily. I'm not in any rush to go lay minus 400. Um, but anyone that got down at, you know, at minus 300, I'd be betting it. Let's put it that way. At minus 300, I'd be betting it. I'd be on the Fernandez side over Muhammad Yaya yeah, yeah, for sure. Let's go. Let's go. Amazing Gazib. Amazing Gazib. Listen, it's at the heavyweight level, okay, where we know there's a lot of randomness involved because of the power they have. There's no way Shamil's supposed to win this fight, uh, obviously. There's no way I'm going to lay 250, 270 on Shamil over Dante Mays. Gun the head, I'm betting Shamil if I got to pick the winner. But I'm not trying to pick the winner. I'm trying to find line value. And in this side, it's Dante Mays or nothing at all. Forget Gazeev in this side. He may end up being the parlay killer. One of these favorites is going to be the parlay killer. I'm not sure who that is. Um, Sam Hughes, Dudikova. I love Sam Hughes in this fight. She's probably still going to lose this fight, but she's still a great bet. I would have liked it a little bit more. It would have been a 4% a, a play had this line gone up. It opened 180. I thought it was going to go the other way. It would get to that minus 200 range. Um, but no surprise it's come down because of the sharp money that's gone against Dudikova. And it's just a, a fate of Dudikova. If you look at her, her two UFC wins, they come against opponents that have done nothing. Her last opponent, I think, didn't have a single UFC win. She was like 0-3, and 0-4. Oh and, and her prior opponent had lost like three or four straight going into the fight with Dudikova. So against someone like Sam Hughes, who's going to fight for your money, it's definitely a step up. It's as, as as close to a coin, much closer to a coin flip than a 60-40 in favor of Dudikova. Um, the, the problem is the age difference. I believe there's a stance or reach difference as well. So Dudikova's got the advantages, got the edges, uh, but uh, no way should she be higher 
then even one, even at 150, I don't think I could look at the Dudakova side. I really don't. I think even at minus 150, I would still look at Sam Hughes. So yeah, it looks like Sam Hughes or leave it alone. Giant Haber, I love that sign. Uh, the line continues to drop. That scares the shit out of me. Um, one of my sharpest sources of information is on Jai Herbert and actually bet him twice. It's the kind of confidence my guys have. When they bet him and the line moves against them, you know, they'll leave it alone. Meaning the, they lay minus 160, it goes minus 200, they're not going to bet it. But let's say they lay minus 160 and the line goes down to minus 130. Unless there's information that they think they missed or an injury or something like that, they're going to look to take another position probably, right? If they're confident, that's what you should do. Well, that's exactly what my man did. My man came back and said, Ace, can you get me down some more? Can you get me down another X, sir? And uh, that's what we did. These dudes are idiots. They keep calling. Forgive me. All right. Who else are we? Where else are we? Where else are we? Oh, Dumas and Teulian. Where is that? Teulian. I always mess up that name. i take the dog there. I mean, Cedric should win this fight, but he's just too high of a favorite. Anything above minus 200 is just too high there. Sure, he should probably beat Teulian two out of three times, but this line reflects higher than that. So to have an edge, You'd have to conclude he wins three out of four. With this one, should be about that minus three hundred range, and you can't get there in this fight with with Dumas. No chance. So it's one of those spots where he should win, but it's a bad bet. Like that's the thing with with uh, all sports. There's always going to be a winner. There's go, side A or side B is going to win. There's always going to be a winner. And sometimes a push, but that's rare. There's going to be a winner, side A or side B. But that doesn't always mean there was a good bet. And it doesn't always mean the side that won was a good bet. A lot of times the side that won's actually a terrible bet. Um, so keep that in mind. Because again, every every fight, someone's going to win, someone's going to lose. But it doesn't mean we had good bets there. So you will be getting the rest of the MMA card. Um, you'll get some today, probably, most likely. What are we in so far? We're just on Jai Herbert as a 4%. We're on the Magomedov as a 4%. So, yeah, we got some more coming your way for sure. That's going to do it for today. Uh, let's have a good weekend. Let's do some damage. We've got some action in there today. We'll definitely have some action in there tomorrow and Sunday. Let's end the week winning. Let's uh, get ready for NFL and college football. I'm telling you now, I'm so psyched, so prepared. Every single night I read another chapter. Actually, I'm going through the second time around through my books. And the only reason I do that, honestly, is more or less to fade the narrative. I'm not looking to pick up any kind of nuggets that I'm going to bet on. I'm looking to take advantage of what the narratives are because all those are a waste of time. The 99% of those preview shows are, are nothing more than just find that narrative and get ready to bet against it. It's almost like the end of week one going into week two. Everyone's talking about just one game, talking about playoffs, talking about Super Bowl after only one damn result after 60 minutes of football. But that's all we're going to have to talk about, right? There's nothing else to talk about. Um, so for six days, they're going to just talk about that game, that game, that game, and those teams. So don't let that shit fool you in. That's all noise. That's all noise. Ignore the noise. Stay on the grind. We have the access to the best information out there. Numbers do not lie, and they will do what they're supposed to over time, like always. Just rinse and repeat, rinse and repeat. Stay the course. Manage risk correctly and your edge will manifest profit. The easiest thing to do when you have an edge. You just have to have the timing. Time in, time in. Not timing, time in. Love you guys. Have a great day. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. And again, thank you so much. Thank you, Ernesto. Thank you, Shane. Thank you all. Love you guys. God bless you and your families. And uh, let's do some damage.